Airborne by Kenneth O'Pill. Copyright 2004 by Firewing Productions Incorporated. Chapter 1 Ship's Eyes. Sailing toward dawn, and I was perched atop the crow's nest, being the ship's eyes. We were two nights out of Sydney, and there had been no weather to speak of so far. I was keeping watch on a dark stack of nimbus clouds off to the northwest, but we were leaving it far behind, and it looked to be smooth going all the way back to Lionsgate City, like riding a cloud. The sky pulsed with stars. Some people say it makes them lonesome when they stare up at the night sky. I can't imagine why. There's no shortage of company. By now, there's not a constellation I can't name. Orion, Lupus, Serpens, Hercules, Draco. My father taught me all their stories. So when I look up, I see a galaxy of adventures and heroes and villains all jostling together and trying to outdo one another. And I sometimes want to tell them to hush up and not distract me with their chatter. I've glimpsed all the stars ever discovered by astronomers, and plenty that haven't been. There are the planets, too, to look at, depending on the time of year. Venus, Mercury, Mars, and don't forget Old Man Moon. I know every crease and pockmark on that face of his. My watch was almost at an end, and I was looking forward to climbing into my bunk, sliding under warm blankets and into a deep sleep. Even though it was only September and we were crossing the equator, it was still cool at night up in the crow's nest, parting the winds at 75 miles per hour. I was grateful for my fleece-lined coat. Spyglass to my face, I slowly swept the heavens. Here at the Aurora's summit, shielded by a glass observation dome, I had a 360 view of the sky around and above the ship. The lookout's job was to watch for weather changes and for other ships. Over the Pacificus, you didn't see much traffic, though earlier I'd caught the distant flicker of a freighter plowing the waves toward the Orient. But boats were no concern of ours. We sailed 800 feet above them. The smell of fresh baked bread wafted up to me. Far below, in the ship's kitchens, they were taking out the first loaves and rolls and cinnamon buns and croissants and danishes. I inhaled deeply. A better smell than this I couldn't imagine, and my stomach gave a hungry twist. In a few minutes, Mr. Riddehoff would be climbing the ladder to take the watch, and I could swing past the kitchen and see if the ship's baker was willing to part with a bun or two. He almost always was. A shooting star slit the sky. That made 106 I'd seen this season. I'd been keeping track. Baz and I had a little contest going, and I was in the lead by 12 stars. Then I saw it. Or didn't see it. Because at first all I noticed was a blackness where stars should have been. I raised my spyglass again and, with the help of the moon, caught a glimpse. It was a hot air balloon hanging there in the night sky. Its running lights weren't on which was odd. The balloon was higher than us by about a hundred feet, drifting off our starboard bow. The burner came on suddenly, jetting blue flame to heat the air in the balloon's envelope for a few seconds. But I couldn't see anyone at the controls. They must have been set on a clockwork timer. Nobody was moving around in the gondola. It was deep and wide big enough for a kind of sleeping cabin on one side, and plenty of storage underneath. I couldn't ever recall seeing a balloon this far out. I lifted the speaking tube to my mouth. Crow's nest reporting. 
I waited a moment as my voice hurtled down through the tube, 150 feet to the control car suspended from the Aurora's belly. Go ahead, Mr. Cruz. It was Captain Vulcan on watch tonight, and I was glad, for I much preferred him to the other officers. Some of them just called me Cruz or Boy, figuring I wasn't worth a mister on account of my age. But never the captain. To him, I was always Mr. Cruz. And it got so that I'd almost started to think of myself as a mister. Whenever I was back in Lionsgate City on shore leave, and my mother or sisters called me Matt, my own name sounded strange to me at first. Hot air balloon at one o'clock, maybe a half mile off, 100 feet up. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. There was a pause, and I knew the captain would be looking out the enormous wraparound windows of the control car. Because it was set well back from the bow, its view of anything high overhead was limited. And that's why there was always a watch posted in the forward crow's nest. The Aurora needed a set of eyes up top. Yes, I see it now. Well spotted, Mr. Cruz. Can you make out its markings? We'll train the light on it. Mounted at the front of the control car was a powerful spotlight. Its beam cut a blazing swath through the night and struck the balloon. It was in a sorry state, withered and puckered. It was leaking, or maybe the burner wasn't working properly. The endurance, I read into the speaking tube. She looked like she'd endured a bit too much. Maybe a storm had punctured her envelope or bashed her about some, and still no sign of the pilot in the gondola. Along the length of the speaking tube, I heard tinny murmurings from the control car as the captain conferred with the bridge officers. It's not on the flight plan, I heard Mr. Torbay, the navigator, say. Every airship had to register its flight plan before departing. If this vessel wasn't on the plan, it was either a rogue or it had drifted off course for some reason. Any sign of the pilot yet, Mr. Cruz? asked the captain. No, sir. We'll try to raise him on the wireless. I waited. The balloon was not really moving as the wind was so light. We were rapidly gaining. There was something eerie about it, just hanging there like a dead thing all dark and listless in the sky. After a few moments, the captain's voice sounded over the speaking tube. We can't raise anyone on the endurance, Mr. Cruz. No signs of life? None, sir. I felt the slightest heaviness in my heels and knew that we were climbing, the aurora angling gently heavenward to meet the endurance. I lost sight of the gondola, and after a moment I could only see the balloon's very top, as the captain took us closer. Through the crow's nest platform, I felt the ship's pulse slow as the propellers cut back. When you've been aloft as long a time, you can almost predict the ship's every movement through your own skin and sinew, like you're joined together. I heard the captain shouting out the control car window through a bullhorn. Endurance, this is the Aurora. Please respond. Again and again. If the pilot had been asleep, this should have roused him. But after a minute with no response, the captain gave up. Through the speaking tube, I overheard him talking to his rudder man. Come around, Mr. Kahlo. We'll bring her as close as we can and try to take the gondola on board. Likely someone's injured or abandoned ship. Either way, the endurance is in distress. We can't leave her drifting like flotsam to the sky lanes. Bring it on board? Now that would be a feat. A mid-air rescue would surely be tricky. But it was Skyway's law to help another vessel in distress. I heard footsteps coming up the ladder. My watch was over, and I was being relieved by Pieter Riddehoff, a third officer, who was still junior enough to be expected to do crow's nest duty. Cruz? Mr. Riddehoff? I filled him in on the balloon and handed over the spyglass. She's at three o'clock now, I pointed. You can just see her top. We're coming about. Pretty odd business, being over the Pacificus in nothing but a bag of hot air. I just shook my head. 
It seemed madness to be at the mercy of the winds like that, with no means of propulsion. I hoped no one on board was hurt. Down the ladder I went, through the webwork of alum iron beams and bracing wires that gave the aurora her rigid shape. On either side of me hung the walls of the enormous gas cells that kept us aloft. Their fabric, a miraculous substance called gold beater skin, glistened and rustled ever so slightly as I passed, like something alive and breathing. Perfuming the air was the faintest fragrance of ripe mangoes, the smell of the hydrium gas inside the cells. I dropped down onto the keel catwalk, the main thoroughfare. It ran the entire length of the ship, from the control car, the officer quarters, and the luxurious passenger decks. Near the bow, all the way back to the cargo bays and crew quarters in the stern. Normally after my watch, I'd head back to my cabin for sleep, but I had no intention of doing so right now. I was too excited. I felt the ship turning and knew we were coming about to try to pick up the balloon. Mr. Kahlo and two machinists were walking smartly aft toward the cargo bay, and I fell into step behind them. I wanted to see this. Besides, they might need an extra hand. The bay was stacked high with wooden crates and steamer trunks and oversized baggage, but a narrow path ran like a canyon through it all and finally opened out into a large clear area near the loading doors in the ship's hull. There were already a number of sailmakers on the scene, plus the first officer, Paul Ridu, taking on the ship's phone, no doubt with the captain. He caught a glimpse of me and didn't look entirely pleased. Mr. Ridu was a fine pilot, so everyone said, but he wasn't a favorite with the crew. He had a long pale face and pale blue eyes and a reddish nose that made him sound plugged up, and he almost looked like he was on the verge of an annoyed little sigh. You got the feeling Mr. Radu didn't much care for the crew, especially a cabin boy like me. Aren't you off watch, Cruz? He asked me, knowing who I was. Yes, sir, but requesting permission to remain and assist if needed. He sighed. Very well, but get a harness on and stay well back. We'll be opening the bay doors in a moment. Everyone else was already suited up. From a row of hooks on the wall, I took down a leather harness and stepped into it. It fit snugly around my legs and chest, with a long line that clipped on to a mooring ring on the wall. At a nod from Mr. Radu, two crewmen manned the bay doors. Instinctively, I spread my legs apart for balance. Once those doors were opened, the wind, even though it was a gentle one, would come galloping in and knock us about. With a hiss, the two doors pulled in and rolled flush along the ship's hull. The wind, the drone of the engines, and the pungent smell of the tropical sea poured into the bay. Below, starlight painted the ocean silver. We were closing on the balloon, the gondola hanging level with the cargo bay doors. The sound of the engines deepened as they slowed even further. Mr. Radu kept talking into the phone, eyes fixed on the balloon, keeping the captain abreast of our position, and the captain would in turn be instructing his helmsman and telegraphing instructions to the machinists in our four engine cars. He wanted to bring the Aurora in as close as possible without fouling the balloon's rigging in our propellers. It was lucky the night was so calm, or this surely would have been impossible. Mr. Radu hung up the phone and, with a bullhorn raised to his mouth, tried to hail the balloon. Endurance, please respond. This is the airship Aurora. Please respond. Endurance. Nothing. Probably some of our passengers were awake now. Most wouldn't have noticed the ship slowing and turning, but even though the soundproof walls and windows of their cabins and staterooms, that bullhorn would yank a few from their sleep. Damn nuisance, I heard Mr. Radu mutter. Mr. Kahlo, Mr. Chen, grappling hooks. I watched as the two men took hold of their heaving lines, each tipped with a four-pronged grapple. 
The engines had all but stopped, and the Aurora slid slowly alongside the balloon. The gondola was directly opposite us, a good fifty feet distant, I'd say. Heave! Mr. Radu cried out, and the two men, their legs wide, twisted from the waist and let fly. Their lines coiled out into the night, and both grapples hooked the rim of the gondola and held fast. Pull her in! Be quick about it! Mr. Radu always had a way of sounding sharpish. Captain Walken would have said something like, Let's see if we can pull her in, gentlemen, when you're ready. He said please and thank you, always, even though he didn't need to. Orders were orders, but when they came with a please, you felt a lot better following them. The men looped their lines to the winches and started cranking. One arm hooked around a strut. Mr. Radu leaned out and gazed from side to side, checking to make sure the balloon wasn't about to get snarled up in the propellers. Then he glanced up at the balloon itself. Leave off, he shouted. This is as close as it gets. I moved nearer the bay doors and saw that the balloon and the aurora were very close to touching at their widest points. No one wanted a collision even with something as soft as a balloon, for you never knew if there was something sharp that would snag or tear. The problem was, even though the balloon and the aurora were almost touching at their curves, the gondola was still a good 30 feet away. And sinking. I hadn't noticed it at first, but now it was obvious. It wasn't the aurora climbing, it was the balloon falling. Despite the occasional flare of its automated burner, it was sinking, slowly but surely, and the sea would have her if we didn't do anything. Keep her snug, Mr. Radu barked at the men, and they locked their winches, trying to keep the gondola from falling further. Now that it was a little below us, I could see inside. The pilot was sprawled on the gondola's floor. Look! I cried. Still, the gondola was sinking, dropping away from us, and its big balloon coming lower with it, its fat girth falling ever closer to our propellers. Just then, Captain Walken strode in. He was the kind of man everyone felt safer being around. If he'd been wearing a velvet robe and crown, he'd be the very image of a great king. If he were in a doctor's jacket, you'd trust your life to him. If he were in a carpenter's smock, you'd know he'd build you the finest house imaginable. But I preferred him in his blue captain's jacket, with the four gold stripes on the sleeve, and his cap encircled with thick gold cord. His beard and mustache were trim, and he had steady, kind eyes. He was approaching sixty, with a full head of gray curly hair, and wide in the shoulders. He wasn't a particularly big man, or even tall, but when he walked into the room you could almost sense everyone exhaling in relief and thinking, there now, things will work out just fine. The captain needed only to glance at the situation. Mr. Radu, would you please return to the control car and assume my watch? I'll take over here, thank you. Yes, sir, said Mr. Radu, but I could tell he didn't much like that. Ready the David, please, gentlemen, Captain Watkins said. Centered before the bait doors was a davit, a small crane with an extendable arm that swung out and raised and lowered cargo when we were docked. The crew sprang to it at once, manning the lines and wheeling out the davit's arm to its full length. Let's see if she'll reach, the captain said. Swing her out, please. Breathless, I watched, wondering if it would be long enough. I knew what the captain had in mind. I kept looking down at the man on the gondola floor. He was deathly white in the flare of the aurora spotlight. But then I saw him stir slightly, a hand twitch. The davit's arm slowly swung all the way out as far as it would go. It was still at least six feet shy of the gondola. Pity, said the captain calmly. Bring her back in, please, gentlemen. I looked down and saw the water close below us. The captain had vented a little hydrium to keep us level with the balloon, but now we had gone as low as we safely could. Any nearer was foolhardy, for you never knew when a sudden gust or rogue front might clutch the ship and thrust her down into the drink. Well, gentlemen, we've not much time, the captain said. 
The situation is simple and our course of action clear. Someone's going to need to hook themselves to the end of the davit and swing across to the gondola. It's the only way to get to her before she goes down. I looked across at Mr. Kahlo and Mr. Chen and the machinists and sailmakers, their faces gray in the starlight, none relishing the idea of careening out over the ocean. I held my breath, hoping. The captain stared straight at me and smiled. Mr. Cruz, I look at you, and of all the men, you're the one who shows not the slightest hint of fear. Am I right? Yes, sir. I have no fear of heights. I know it, Mr. Cruz. And he did, for I'd served aboard his ship for more than two years, and he'd seen the ease with which I moved about the Aurora, inside and out. Sir, said Mr. Chen, the lad shouldn't be the one. Let me go. And all at once, the other crewmen were vigorously offering themselves for the job. Very good, gentlemen, said the captain, but I think Mr. Cruz really is the best suited. If you're still willing, Mr. Cruz? Yes, sir. We'll not tell your mother about this. Agreed? I smiled and gave a nod. Is your harness snug? It is, sir. I was glowing with pride and hoped the others wouldn't see the flush of my cheeks. The captain came and checked my harness himself, his strong hands testing the straps and buckles. Be careful, lad, he told me quietly, then stepped back. All right, Mr. Cruz, hook yourself up to the davit and we'll swing you over. He said it as if he were proposing to stroll up to a deck to take in the view. He hadn't chosen me just because he thought I was least fearful. Any of the other crew would have done it. But I was light, too. The lightest here by 60 pounds. The captain was afraid the gondola might be too flimsy to carry her own weight once she was hooked and reeled in. And he didn't want anything heavy added to her. Above all, he needed someone light. But I was still honored he trusted me with the job. The davit's cable ended with a deep hook and onto this hook I shackled the ends of my two safety lines. They winched me up a little, so it was like sitting on a swing. Up close, the davit's arm seemed a frail enough bit of metal to hang your life upon, but I knew she could carry fifty of me. I know you'll not falter, the captain told me. Here, you'll need this to cut the balloon's flight lines. He passed me up his knife. I slid it through a buckle of my harness. If you're ready, we'll send you over. Ready, sir. With that, the crew swung the davit's arm out. I saw the deck of the cargo bay give way to the ocean's silvered surface, dark and supple as a snake skin, four hundred feet below. The arm swung to its farthest point and stopped. The gondola was still out of reach, its rim about six feet below me now. Inside, the man shifted again, and I thought he moaned, but that might have been the wind or the creak of the cable unwinding, or maybe some whale song out to sea. Lower me some, please, I called over my shoulder. Looking back at the ship did give me a moment's pause. It wasn't fear, more interest, really. Just the oddness of it. I'd never seen the aurora from this angle, me dangling mid-air, the crewmen standing on the lip of the deck, staring down at me through the open cargo bay doors. They paid out more cable until I was at the same level as the gondola, not six feet away. I felt no fear. If someone had put an ear to my chest, he'd find it beating no faster than it had in the crow's nest. It was not bravery on my part, simply a fact of nature, for I was born in the air, and so it seemed the most natural place in the world to me. I was slim as a sapling and light on my feet. The crew all joked I had seagull bones, hollow in the center to allow for easy flight. To swing across this little gap, 400 feet aloft, was no more to me than skipping a crack in the pavement. But because deep in my heart, I felt that if I were ever to fall, the air would support me, hold me aloft, just as surely as it did a bird with spread wings. There was a bit of a breeze building now, twirling me some at the end of the cable. I grabbed both my safety lines and started pumping my legs. A youngster on a playground swing. Back and forth. Back and forth. At the forward end of my arc, when I looked down, I figured I was almost over the rim of the gondola. Just a little bit more. 
Back I went, legs folded tight. Then, that moment when you're almost motionless, just hanging there for a split second before you start swinging forward again. Let run the line, I shouted. I kicked forward, body flat, legs shooting out, and felt myself drop suddenly, and keep dropping. I sat up quickly as the cable paid out, and I was slanting down towards the gondola fast, but falling short. I flung myself forward, stretching, and just hooked my forearm over the gondola's lip. My body slammed into the side, scratching my face against the wicker and knocking all my breath out. It took a moment to suck some air into me. My arms sang with pain. I heard the crew above in the aurora cheering me. I heaved myself up, scrabbling with my feet for purchase, and then crashed over into the gondola, beside the man. But there was no time to tend to him. I stood, grabbed hold of the davit hook, and unshackled my two safety lines. Then I cast about for somewhere to secure to attach the hook. It had to be something strong, for it would be bearing the gondola's entire weight once I cut the balloon free. Above my head was a metal frame that supported the burners. The frame had four metal struts that were welded to the gondola's iron rim. It all seemed a little rickety, but it would have to be good enough. I saw nothing better. I curled the hook around the burner frame, as close to its center as I could manage. Reel her in! I bellowed up at the aurora. I saw the line quickly swing up and become taut. The hook grabbed. The gondola shuddered. A long, nasty squeal came from the burner frame. I didn't like the sound of that at all. I stared, breath stoppered in my throat, at those four bits of metal that tethered the burner frame to the gondola. They were never supposed to support the gondola's entire weight. That's what the balloon was meant to do. But now the balloon was coming down, slowly collapsing toward the gondola. And the burner! The whole lot might go up in flames, with me and the pilot caught underneath. Flight lines! Flight lines! I'd never sailed a balloon, and the rigging was unfamiliar to me. There were eight lines holding the balloon to the gondola, two stretching up from each corner. Take care, Mr. Cruz! I heard the captain shout down at me. I glanced overhead. Despite being hooked to the davit, the gondola was dragging the great balloon ever closer to the Aurora's hull and engines. In a few minutes, they'd collide. I had to be quicker. The knife glinted in the starlight as I sawed away at the first flight line. It was a thick braid, and my heart sank when I began, but the captain's sharp knife bit deep and kept going. Snap went that first line, and the gondola didn't even shift. I did the line opposite, not wanting the gondola to start hanging crooked. The balloon was sagging now, almost to the burner. I didn't have time to fuss about looking for the gas valve to shut it down, but I was sorely afraid of a fire. The third and fourth lines went. At my feet, the man moaned again, and his arm twitched and knocked against my boot. I slashed through the fifth line. I looked up and saw the balloon slowly billowing down toward me, all but blotting out my view of the aurora. It was awfully close to the engine cars and their propellers. The sixth line went, and now there were but two lines tethering the balloon to the gondola, attached to opposite corners. Suddenly the burner came on triggered by its clockwork timer, and a geyser of blue-hot flame leapt up and scorched the fabric of the balloon. It caught immediately, spreading high. I checked the davit hook. For once I cut these last two lines, the only thing holding us would be that hook and the aurora's crane. My wrist throbbed as I began slashing through the seventh line. With a mighty crack, the frayed rope snapped high into the air and the entire gondola slewed over. The unconscious pilot slid toward me and crumpled up against the low side. Without the crane's cable holding us, we would have been tipped out into the sea. I hauled myself to the high side and the last flight, flight line. The smell of burning fabric was terrible now, though luckily the smoke and flames were mostly dancing up away from me. But the weight of the blazing balloon was oozing down over the frame now, starting to engulf the gondola. 
Frantically, I slashed at the last flight line. Something burning hit my shoulder and I struck it off. And then I saw with a panic that a bit of the wicker was alight. I deal with it later. That last flight line needed cutting. Furiously, I attacked it with my knife, severed it, then grabbed hold of the gondola's side as it jerked violently down. The metal burner frame shrieked with stress as it took the full weight. Suspended only on the davit hook, the gondola swung out from underneath the blazing balloon, and just in time. A flame, it seeped quickly downward, cut lines trailing, undulating, like a giant jellyfish intent on the ocean's bottom. I held my breath as it fell past the gondola. Fire crackled in the wicker, and I grabbed a blanket from the floor and smothered the flames. There was a sharp tug from the cable, and we were being reeled in, rocking. I made sure the fire was out, and then knelt down beside the man. I felt badly that he'd been jostled about so roughly. Gently, I turned him over onto his back and put a blanket beneath his head. He looked to be in his sixties. Through the whiskers, his face had a sharpened look to it, all cheekbones and nose. Lips scabbed over by wind and lack of water. A handsome gentleman. I didn't really know what else to do, so I just held his hand and said, There now, we're almost aboard, and Doc Halliday will take a look at you and get you all sorted out. For a moment, it looked like his eyes might open, but then he just frowned and shook his head a little, and his lips parted and he mumbled silently for a bit. Scattered on the floor, we were all manner of things. Empty water bottles and unopened cans of food. An astrolabe, dividers, a compass, and rolled up charts. From overhead came a terrible shriek, and I looked up to see one of the burner frame's metal struts rip loose from the gondola's rim. We were too heavy! I stared in horror, watching as the frame began twisting from the stress of her load. Hurry! I bellowed up at the aurora. We were getting reeled up fast, but not fast enough, for with a mighty jerk, a second strut ripped clean out. The entire gondola started to slowly keel over as the remaining struts weakened. We were level with the cargo bay now, but still needed to be swung inside, and the gondola was slewing over about to dump us into the drink. The metal frame was groaning and shrieking. I grabbed hold of the gondola's side with one hand and the man's wrist with the other, knowing I had not the strength to hold us both in if the gondola tried to tip us out. I looked up and saw the hook screeching along the burner frame, sparking, about to come off the ripped metal strut and we would surely fall. A violent bump. And we were set down onto the deck of the cargo bay, inside. I heard the captain's voice. Bay doors closed, please. Mr. Carlo, call the bridge and tell them to take her back to 700 feet. And then everyone was at the side, looking over into the gondola. Doc Halliday was climbing in beside me and I stepped back to make room for him. A hand clapped me on the shoulder and I turned to see Captain Walken smiling at me. Good work, Mr. Cruz. Very good work indeed. I felt terribly thirsty all of a sudden and tired all the way through my bones, and then remembered that I'd been on duty for more than 16 hours, and normally would have been in my bunk asleep. Instead, I'd been swinging across the sky. I started to climb out, but my knees went wobbly, and Captain Walken and Mr. Chen grabbed me under the arms and swung me to the deck. You're a brave man, Matt Cruz, Mr. Chen said. No, sir, just light. Lighter than air, that's our Mr. Cruz, said one of the sailmakers. Cloud hopping next, it'll be. Hands tussled my hair, clapping me on the back, voices saying, well done, and me trying not to smile, but smiling and laughing anyway, because it felt so good to know I'd brought the gondola in, saved the pilot, and impressed everyone. All these men who had known my father. They would have called him Mr. Cruz, too. Doc Halliday and another crewman were lifting the pilot out of the gondola to a waiting stretcher. Is he going to be all right? I asked the doctor. I don't know yet, was all Doc Halliday answered, and his young face looked so grave I felt 
a queer squeeze in my stomach. The wicker gondola looked odd and out of place in our cargo bay. Get some sleep, Mr. Cruz, the captain said to me. I nodded, but didn't want to go. I watched them take the pilot away on the stretcher. I wondered who he was. I wanted to go through the gondola and find out what had gone wrong. Sleep first, Mr. Cruz, said the captain. Your father would have been very proud of you. I blinked away the hot tingle behind my eyes. Thank you, sir. My legs wobbled as I left the cargo bay and trudged aft along the keel catwalk to the crew quarters. Lighter than air, but I felt heavy as lead. I opened the door to my cabin, caught a glimpse of the clock. 5.39. I shrugged off my shirt and trousers and climbed into my bunk. And as so often happened when I slept aloft, I drifted free of my body and glided alongside the aurora. And my father came and joined me. And we flew. In the afternoon, I was off duty. So I went to the infirmary to see how the balloon pilot was making out. Not good, Matt, Doc Holliday told me. He's got pneumonia, and I believe he had a seizure of the heart several days ago. He's terribly dehydrated. He'll live, though? The doctor lifted his eyebrows, and his lips compressed into a sad little smile. I think not, Matt. Even if he were back on shore... His heart and lungs are so damaged, there's not much to be done. Who is he? Benjamin Malloy. According to the ship's papers, he was trying to make a solo circumnavigation. You heard such things from time to time. Some fellow trying to float around the world in a hot air balloon. No one had managed it yet. They always got grounded or were never heard from again. I didn't know if this Mr. Malloy was brave or just plain foolhardy, but I couldn't help but admire his daring. May I see him, please? Doc Halliday hesitated, then nodded. He's asleep, mind. Don't wake him. The infirmary was off the main dispensary, an examination room, just two beds divided by a curtain. The other bed was empty. I pulled up the chair and sat down beside Mr. Malloy. He was propped up with pillows, and his breathing was raspy. It was strange the way I felt about him. Connected was the only word I could conjure up. I'd spotted his balloon out there in the night sky, and I'd swung onto his gondola and found him lying, crumpled on the deck, looking so broken and helpless. Maybe it was also because he looked a little like an older version of my father. But that might have just been imaginings on my part. I put my hand on top of his. It was scalding with fever, ridged with sinew and bone, and my own hand felt icy against it. He shifted, and I took my hand away, afraid I'd disturbed him. His eyes opened. They were milky, and he stared through me like he was focused on something else, like he was already leaving. He coughed a bit, and I held a glass of water to his mouth, but he didn't seem to want it, or maybe he couldn't swallow. A little spilled down to his chin and onto his bedsheets. I'm sorry, sir, I said, mopping him with the cloth. When I finished, I looked back at him, and his eyes were intent now. Did you see them? He asked me, his voice scratchy. Who? I wondered if he was thinking clearly. Sailing all around, he said. It took him a long time to get this out, swallowing and giving little coughs between the words. Probably always been there, only no one's ever seen them. He tried to get up, pushing with his elbows like he had somewhere important to go. But he didn't have the strength, and he sank back down. He turned to me again, swallowed. But you must have seen them. It seemed to matter to him, so I lied. Yes, I said. I saw them too. Good, he said, and that seemed to calm him down some. Beautiful creatures, he said, smiling. They were beautiful. Yes, I said. He coughed again, and I wondered if I should call for Doc Holliday. 
I'll get the doctor for you, sir. His hot hand was on my arm. Kate would have loved them, he said. Don't you think? I think so, I said. He was looking at me very kindly, and I felt ashamed of my lying. And then it was as if he saw through me, and it was terrible to see the way his face changed, disgust pouring into his eyes. You never saw them. His words were all gaspy now, and it started him coughing again, his whole body jerking. I looked around in worry. Doc Holliday was coming now, telling me it was best I left. I went away, feeling terrible. Maybe if I'd talked to him differently, he wouldn't have got so riled up. Maybe if I'd said things better. An hour or so later, Doc Holliday found me in the kitchen, polishing the silver for dinner, and told me Benjamin Malloy had just died. I was surprised at how wet my eyes got. I didn't really know him at all. Doc Holliday squeezed my arm. You mustn't take him to heart, Matt. He was a very sick man. I nodded. I just wish he hadn't been so vexed at me when he died. I told the doctor what he'd said to me. Doc Halliday smiled kindly. The dying often say strange things. It's got nothing to do with you. But that night, on my watch, Benjamin Malloy's words sounded over and over in my head, and I wondered what it was he'd seen, or thought he'd seen. Something winged in the sky by the sound of it. Beautiful creatures. Maybe he'd caught sight of an albatross or some other great seafaring bird. Though certainly it was a rare thing so deep over the ocean. Well, there was no shortage of fanciful stories about winged things. Angels and dragons. Sky kelpies and cloud sphinxes. They always turned out to be something else. A glare off the water, shadows and mist, a mirage projected by a tired sailor's bleary eyes. But that night, I had to admit, I kept a sharp lookout as I swept the horizons and hopscotched over my constellations. I saw nothing out of the ordinary, none of Benjamin Malloy's beautiful creatures. But I wish I had. I like to think there was no end of things aloft in the sky, unseen by us.